Hey, all right, everybody. Gosh, uh, what a pleasure it is. I know that some people are still coming in, but I just want to say what a huge honor, what a pleasure it is to have this ability to connect with you all um, on Zoom. And I'm an easily excited guy. It doesn't take a whole lot to get me going. But even with my, you know, disposition toward, you know, extra excitement, I have to tell you, today is a big one for me. Um, I have two people that are going to be sharing this call with me both of whom I have a ton of respect for, not only the people, but also the conversation. So we're gonna jump straight into this. Weston, why don't you go ahead and fire off an introduction for us? Yeah, hey everybody, my name is Weston Kieschnick. Awkward Zoom waves for everyone, because that's what we do now in this medium, right? So uh, Weston Kieschnick, and uh, the only thing you all need to know about me is this, uh, uh, I love teaching, uh, like it's a problem. I uh, love teaching so much that I was, uh, I was a high school teacher for about 15 years before I dug into school administration. I uh, love teaching so much. I write books on teaching, host a podcast on teaching, and uh, also married a teacher, right? Which means my kids are going to grow up to be resentful, teachers. probably. <laughs> yeah, not teachers. No, no. If you said teachers, the word is resentful because that's all we talk about at my house. So uh, yeah, I'm thrilled to be here with all of you to talk about educational technology, to talk about relationships and how we use one to cultivate the other. So uh, I'm excited. Josh, Charlie, thanks for having me, you guys, and happy to engage in some dialogue for a bit. Awesome. Charlie, take it away. Hey, I'm Charlie Williams. I've been uh, in educational technology one way or another, but not within a school district, right? Sort of from the outside working uh, with, with first manufacturers and now a reseller in education for about 15 years. And um, it's, been, it's been a ton of fun. It's really fun because you feel like uh, you have a sort of a missional uh, purpose behind that. And I currently for Trafera and the Senior Vice President of Sales Channel and Marketing. So have an incredible team of people out there touching base, including Josh, right, uh, who's going to host us uh, with our customers all the time, right, whether we're asking you for, for your business, or we're just trying to find out what's going on in the market, or, uh, you know, talk a little bit about uh, what we do. But Josh is on, Josh is on my team. We love Josh to death. So uh, that's me. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Fantastic. Well, um, just to let everybody know, as far as housekeeping goes, uh, we are recording the webinar and we can, you know, come back and view this later. If you have questions or comments, feel free to use the chat. Uh, Weston, I want to start with you. We have a ton of stuff to get into. One of the things that we say at Trafera all the time, you can't walk down the hallways without hearing this. People are more important than things. You can have all the great things, but you know what, if we don't also invest in people, we are wasting our time. And that seems to be the theme of your newest book, Bold School. So can you share a little bit about what compelled you to write on that topic? Yeah, so it's it, it was one of the reasons why I was so excited to sort of talk and, and, and partner with you all for this event, because, you know, if you if you take a look inside the pages of Bold School, you'll see my philosophy, which is that technology is awesome and teachers are better. And it's it's always been something I've subscribed to. And so sort of the genesis for the messaging behind uh, in bold school and breaking bold was exactly that. You know, I uh, I'll tell you, I was uh, I was an early adopter in the ed tech space. Uh, I taught in my first blended classroom one to one in 2003 when all of my kids had those big thick thick like laptop computers and we we're trying to find Ethernet cord long enough to plug into all of this stuff, right? And so uh, I, I I got uh, increasingly frustrated. Uh, from 2003 onward, because I just kept hearing messages over and over and over again from uh, from really reputable people that technology was going to be the thing. Uh, this was going to be the silver bullet, the thing that uh, cured what ailed education. And uh, I just, you know, I started to look back on my experience, not just as a, as a teacher, but also as a student. And I started to look back on influential teachers in my life. And, and I'll can, I, I can tell you, like, I've asked hundreds of thousands of people, like, to tell me about their most influential teacher uh, when I go and present. And you know what I never hear? Like, I, I, I never hear like, man, Miss Miller could work a graphic organizer like nobody's business. Like, I, like I never hear that. Josh. Great, great tech, great technologist, you know? Yes, yeah, it, yeah, yeah. I never hear like, man, you know what? The organ trail that I played in Miss Jones's <laughs> class was it, like, that you never hear about that. When you think oh. about influence, like, Influence lives in within the context and the confines of the relationships that we have with adults in our lives. And the greatest gift that we can give a child is 
believe it or not, not more stuff. Like it's a relationship with an adult who believes with relentless tenacity in our ability to succeed. And I was interested in technology as a, contu as a conduit uh, for those relationships as opposed to an obstruction. Uh, and, and apparently lots of others are as well. And so that, that, that's what gets me excited. Well, I can tell you, if that was your motive for writing, it was mission accomplished. I feel like I was on Thanks, page two of that book and I had to put it down and go grab a pen because I was going to mark up the margins. And <laughs> I felt like a call to action to me. It really did. And and it wasn't just me. I know that, that our company feels really compelled to to take a, a strategic ownership, a, a a defined ownership in the success of the students we serve. And that's actually one of the questions that I wanted to pivot over to Charlie because, <clears throat> you know, one of the things that we say quite often is that everyone has a role to play in the success of the students that we serve. It doesn't, if you're a teacher, that's great. That seems like it's a pretty defined role, right? But it, it extends beyond just the teacher to the principal, to the parent, to the custodian, to the cook. And in our case, the tech provider. And I just wonder, you know, from your perspective, Charlie, what are we as a company doing to make sure that we're investing in the students that we're serving? Boy, that's, that's, that's a great question. I'd say probably, I think number one, we have to acknowledge that that's a question that it's time to ask technology providers, right? We, um, you know, some technology providers have a perspective that's like, hey, here's the technology, good luck. Um, we went through an evolution as an organization, um, and we've got an interesting history, but where we definitely said, well, we're going to take some ownership in um, keeping devices running, right? Like we're, okay, we got to keep devices fixed and deployed and running. And so we do a ton of services there. And, uh, but what, what really started to stick out as, as for now, probably over a decade, this has been happening, but as the lines are kind of breaking between the, the ivory tower of an IT department and, and instructional or educational parts of a school, like that's been, that's been breaking apart for a long time. That's not new. But what it's doing is it's putting uh, responsibility now on us just tech vendors to now speak education, right? Speak teacher, be able to have these conversations. Um, the, the two things that come to mind like right away, I think in terms of like, what are we, what are we actually meaningfully doing right now besides listening and learning and, and saying, okay, we have to ask ourselves this question. We are getting involved in professional development, right? Which is uh, Josh, you have this, this background here and you've been with us now for some time, learning a lot about that. And then um, I've, offering content that we think we can offer uniquely from the position we're in, which is interesting because what we're doing is we're going all over the country, getting people who are great technology educators to put content into this new thing called trails, we call it. And we're, and we're talking about that a lot right now. It's lesson plans uh, for people who want to use technology to help kids learn. And that's the simple non-teacher version of what it is, but it's, it, it's technology driven lesson plans to help you as a teacher actually use your technology with educational outcomes. Right. Um, and we're offering that to all of our customers, um, at least initially, we're getting it out there effectively for free um, and because we want to be an inspiration to teachers to use technology and use it effectively. Um, so that, that's where we're at right now, I think. Char that's Charlie, awesome. it, sorry, Josh, if you don't like, Charlie, I think this needs to be a thing that people start uh, demanding from all of their tech providers, right? Mm -hmm. Which is like it, it, this notion that technology and pedagogy are separate uh, can't mm -hmm. exist anymore in our community. I mean, when it, 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 there was there was this idea that we can take technology, we can roll it into classrooms, and teachers will figure it out. Mm -hmm. uh, and and mm -hmm. what we discovered, uh, I would say very quickly, but quite frankly, very slowly, uh, if you ask mm -hmm. me, is that th they don't they, and they haven't. Uh, I, it, but we would never we would never assume that of other professionals professionals right like nobody took MRI no. technology when it first arrived rolled it into hospitals and said like I bet doctors will figure this out right like no <laughs> yeah, like, right. there was like there was specific training that went along with how to use it effectively and efficiently within the context in which it was supposed to be used and so uh, right. I, I, I appreciate that sentiment because you know the expectation that you, we can roll technology into a classroom into a school into a district and teachers are going to figure it out is a complete fallacy like they need those supports. Well, yeah. and it's, and, and we have to sort of, I mean, again, from, from a business perspective, we try to identify our customer and what is the most important thing to our customer and help them achieve those outcomes. And again, since the IT department now has been included in the conversation of education, right? The ultimate customer has become the student with yeah. educational outcomes, right? And that's such a big shift for us. That's, that, it, it hurts my brain as a, as a 15 year educational technology uh, you know, vendor, right, from kind of outside the school. And it's, it is, we're slowly learning 
Um, but you know, I, I remember even like four years ago, I had this wake up call moment where this IT director I was talking to bought like 1200 Chromebooks for his school. And, and they're, you know, like a 1500 student school district, small school district. And, and he's like, ah, I'm getting these devices. The teachers really wanted touch screens and you know, I'm just not going to let them have it. And I'm like, well, why did they want touch screens? And he's like, oh, they just, they got all these programs they want to implement now that, that really test screen would be better for these students. They, that's what they think. It's just too expensive. We're not going to work it. And I kid you not, a month later, I called and the guy wasn't at the district. And I'm like, man, that's, boy, that's what's going to happen to us. Yeah. People who think that IT is a cyber tower and, and, and it doesn't matter what, what is important to teachers and student outcomes, right? It's like, boy, if you just stick in that, that bucket over there, you're, you're going to get left out of what's really happening in, in schools. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. That happens all the time when people say, you know, they're shopping for the right technology device. And one of the things that people like myself and Weston always say is you can't get caught up in the device so much. You have to first ask yourself, what are children going to do with that device? Mm -hmm. Then you pick the device that matches the learning outcome, but not in the other way around. You know, mm -hmm. if we get so sucked into the device and this is actually kind of Weston, you might want to speak on this because this is actually kind of the central theme of, uh, bold school was um you know kind of like you know picking the right the right tool for the job and not just grabbing a technology device for the sake of grab, grabbing a technology device but really focused hard on the learning outcomes first yeah it's 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 that's it's that old simon sinek adage right like know your why um mm -hmm. and it's yep. it's hard for us in education because we all know our why it's to be at our best for kids but the hard thing is like you know, excitement can lead people to poor decision making. And when new technologies show up, like there's oftentimes a lot of excitement about that. And that excitement sure. leads to this moment. It's like, yeah. well, what am I going to do with this device tomorrow? I mean, if you, if you don't believe me, everyone, everyone on the call can think about this right now. Uh, think about when Zoom came out with breakout rooms, mm -hmm. right? Think, think about when breakout rooms showed up. And then every freaking meeting you went to, it was just like, you had to get thrown into a breakout room for some reason, not because yeah. you needed to, but because somebody was so excited that breakout rooms were an option, then you had to go sit in a breakout room and stare at four other people uh, for a six minute time before you came back to the main room, right? Like, but that's, that's, it's, it, that's part of human nature, right? Like new things get us excited, but we have to temper that excitement. We have to reconnect with the why, like what's the why behind technology in the first place. And to Charlie's point, right? Like if we're, if we're going to invest uh, uh, valuable time and valuable money into these tools, then our challenge has to be like, okay, what's our why? And, you know, if we're going to uh, pump a bunch of Chromebooks into a mathematics department, like, uh, quite frankly, like, it better have a touchscreen because doing mathematics mm -hmm. on a keyboard mm -hmm. is really, really hard. Complex mathematics mm -hmm. on a keyboard is difficult. And so we mm -hmm. have to connect to what's the why. And it, 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 to your point, Charlie, like, it's got to be about the kids. Mm -hmm. That, you know, Josh, maybe that's a good segue to our actual topic, to power of relationships yeah. and edutech. <laughs> I think we could yeah. definitely talk about, I yeah. think we could talk about all this other stuff. Yeah, I, I love that I, that I get to do this for a living. I love that I get to be part of an organization that thinks, that thinks like we do. This is just, it's, this is so much fun for me. It really is. Weston, there was something that I wanted to ask you about. Um, I kind of alluded to this before we started the webinar, but I can remember being in fourth grade and yeah. I, I had this, I can remember distinctly, we were growing a tomato plant. And, and the te and there was something that the teacher didn't really mean anything, but I'm sure she never thought about it again. She probably never thought about it again, but she said something to me that stung my soul. And I'm 30 years later, and I'm still trying to deal with this. And one of the things that you wrote about in chapter two, you do something interesting with your writing and with public speaking, where you start with something that's really comical and funny, but then you use that as a segue into to a real serious moment. And there was, there was a story that you started to, ch still, um, to tell in chapter two that I think would be a really great, uh, a really great uh, piece for this, for this webinar. Can you share a little bit about that and the power of our words um, um, with students? Yeah, so, so words and relationships matter, um, whether they are words and relationships that show up in a virtual medium, in a hybrid medium, or a face-to-face. -face. And so the story that you're alluding to is uh, the story of my uh, geometry teacher, Miss Stewart. So uh, I'll, I'll tell you this, like I was a high school social studies teacher, uh, and there's a reason, like math. Uh, so math was always a struggle for me 
Um, and I knew math was hard, but there was never a time up until this moment where I told this story where, uh, where I ever questioned that I was smart. And so uh, uh, the story is I'm, I'm sitting there, uh, I'm in high school and I'm taking a geometry class. And I'll tell you what, like proofs, like to this day, if somebody says the word proofs, like it strikes fear into my heart. Like I just, I didn't, I, I was going to say I didn't get them as though it's past tense. I don't get them. I don't, like, I, I don't get it. I don't get it like, st like step A leads to step B. And so like, and I knew that. And it was such a struggle for me. And I remember I'm sitting there in my- All, the, all, the, ma all the math teachers are just exiting the call now. They're like, this guy, I yeah, can't believe. Yeah, drop off, you know? drop off, drop off, right? <laughs> like this guy doesn't get proofs, come on. Yeah, I, I, I apologize. I don't, I don't get them. If you want to talk to me about the Articles of Confederation and, and Colonial America, let's, let's do it. Like I'm, in, I'm interested in that, but it's just like, so uh, I knew I didn't, and uh, we, we had this teacher, well, I call her Miss Stewart in the book uh, to protect her identity. Uh, she was, uh, so she would teach during the school year. And then during the summer, uh, she was actually uh, doing work um, at, at Boeing. Uh, she was just brilliant. And, and she kept telling us all the time mm -hmm. that like teaching was the thing that she did during the school year for fun. And I kept thinking like, well, then I don't think you know what fun means because nothing about what she was doing like looked fun to the rest of us. I was like, if you think this is fun, like you should tell your face because your face does not look like you are having any fun. And she would do this thing where she would be working on a proof and she would, she would like forget we were there. She would turn around and she would look at the board and she'd be working on this proof. And all of a sudden she would like remember there was a class of kids behind her. And then she would turn around and boom, she would ask somebody a question. Right. And I remember she's sitting there writing and I'm just like getting that feeling welling up like, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. Like she's about to turn and point one of us out. And sure enough, boom, she points at me and she says, you know, like, Weston, what's the next step in this proof? You know, and I was just like, well, so I, whatever, yeah. like I, I tried to say the thing that I thought was right, you know, and um, I remember she she looked at me uh, and she asked me, are you retarded? Mm. Right. And, uh, yeah, it was brutal, brutal. And everyone just sort of paused. And, and like I said, like I had known for the longest time uh, that math was really hard for me. Uh, but up until that moment, uh, I had never questioned whether or not I had the mental acuity to actually do it. Um, and so uh, what Mrs. Stewart uh, didn't know at the time was like, I really wanted to go to the Air Force Academy. Like I had my congressional letter, like I was all set and ready to go. But in that moment, like she planted a seed of doubt in my mind about whether or not like I had the mathematical skill to actually be able to accomplish the goal. And so like, I, I tell that story in Breaking Bold and I, I talk about it here because so much time and energy and money and effort gets spent on what's the right tool? What's the right thing? And the fact of the matter is like, I could have been surrounded by the absolutely greatest, most state of the art technology on planet earth at the time. And you know what I, I would have remembered at that moment is how that teacher made me feel. And so mm -hmm. like, it's, it's so critical for us to just be mindful, like in these conversations, like let's keep them within the appropriate context uh, and, and make sure that we are staying rightly ordered in how we think about our technology. Like, do our, do our students need to be participants in more dynamic and instructionally rich uh, and technology rich classrooms? 100%, 100% mm -hmm. they do. And like, let's make sure that we're rightfully ordered relative to uh, the, the place that instruction has uh, at that table. Because I mean, learning mm -hmm. is king and growth is queen and technology is the court jester. And the jester is, is great, the, te the jester has value, but like don't put the jester in charge of the kingdom. Uh, oh and it's, it's what happens often uh, when we go out and buy new technologies, all of a sudden, uh, you know, the, the, the jester becomes uh, king, king and queen of the kingdom. Wow. Wow. I, I, you, you've inspired me. Um, I want to share a quick story. You know, my, so my son, he's that student that uh, all teachers um, are, are afraid of. My son, he's in, he's in the fourth grade right now. He always starts the year slow and he's, he loves technology, but he's so distracted by it. It's funny, I'm looking behind me. This is my kid's Chromebooks on the table here, piled, <laughs> piled up like my children pile up all their technology. And um, anyway, you know, he got introduced to Chromebooks in school a few years ago before COVID. And then through COVID, it was just a huge mess. Well, anyway, this last year, we hired a tutor for him because his English language skills were just struggling from, uh, you know, the sort of the COVID year. Yep. And then by a weird twist of events, we did a change of school districts right before the school year started because a lot of just things were happening i'm um, going in it going into this current school year and the tutor that we had hired from a private school ended up being my son's teacher oh. so 
he had had a three month relationship he had built with him where he was working with him on Chromebooks, on English language projects. And then we went into the school year and my son for the first time ever has actually thrived from the beginning to the end of the school year. And what we figured out was it's not that it wasn't actually really the tutoring. He ended the year of tutoring basically on par with where he needed to be. It was the relationship yes. because every year he's started the school year uh, poorly and then ended the school year fine. He's on, he's on plan by the end of the school year. Um, and it just takes that long for him to build that relationship with that teacher. And so going into the school year, having a relationship with the teacher, he was immediately responsive, immediately took, took, you know, um, took responsibility uh, for, for technology because he had this person for the technology, for the homework that he had kids, this person he really liked and respected and wanted to make happy, uh, which normally takes kids a lot longer to build up, especially with all the beginning of school year distractions. So I have no idea how we're going to replicate that ever in the future, right? But um, it was incredible to see the effect of this year. This relationship this person had with my kid actually had a meaningful impact on his education. He made honor roll three out of the, uh, or two out of the three uh, semesters. And we were like, oh my gosh, look what's happening. And it was this relationship with this teacher. It was incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Like it's like relationships matter. Relationships mm. matter. Right. And, and it's uh, like, I'm so, I'm so happy for your son. I'm so happy for you. And it's just like, this is not a new phenomenon, you know, this mm. notion that relationships, ma I mean, there's this thing that I do during the Breaking Bold uh, keynote that I give sometime where I talk about relationships. And it's just like, you know, if you, again, history nerd moment, like if you look back, like Socrates taught Plato, Plato taught Aristotle, Aristotle went on to teach mm. Alexander the Great, right? Like it's arguably mm. the greatest lineage of student teacher relationships in human history. Like that's not an mm. accident, Right. Mm -hmm. If you take a look at successful people like, you know, a guy like Mark Zuckerberg was uh, Zuckerberg was taught and mentored by Steve Jobs. Right. Like mm. Bill Gates took his business uh, mentorship from his teacher and mentor Warren Buffett. Like they have a 25 mm -hmm. year mentor uh, relationship. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and, and it's just like even even other example, like there's this story out there that uh, John Bon Jovi told on the uh, uh, Armchair Expert podcast for any podcast listeners out there. But he talked about being 16 years old and he's playing guitar in a bar, right? John Bo so number one, he's 16 years old. Number two, he's in a bar. Uh, already a great story, right? So he's sitting there and he's playing his guitar in the bar uh, and he admits really, really poorly, right? But he's just trying to get gigs. He's trying to get stage time. So he's playing this guitar. Another musician walks into the back of the bar, sees this kid, 16 year old John Bon Jovi playing really terribly, walks up on stage, grabs another guitar and starts to like jam with this kid. Uh, and it started a relationship, right? Between teacher and student uh, that endured for a really long time. Uh, and it just so happens that musician who came up uh, to play with John Bon Jovi was Bruce Springsteen, right? Like, like relationships matter. And <laughs> oh, if, you know, if you, if you take a yeah. look at the lineage of successful people, like almost every successful person can trace it back to a relationship they had with, with an adult who took the time and effort uh, to invest wow. with, uh, in them. And the tools are a support. Uh, uh, to that relationship. Right. It, you know, John Bon Jovi doesn't look back at that store and be like, man, you know, you know, what was great about that moment? The guitar. Like, <laughs> no. Yeah, like, right. Like, right. Like, like the guitar is the linchpin mm -hmm. between mm -hmm. the adult and the student in that story. Mm -hmm. And it's exactly what our technology needs to be. Like it's the yeah. linchpin. It's the tie that binds. Uh, and, mm -hmm. But we have to, we have to rightfully order how we think about it. Mm -hmm. Wow. It's so good. It's so good. Well, we just have a few minutes left and we need to um, just check in real quick. I'm, I'm looking at the chat. I don't see that there's any questions in there, but I would encourage anyone who has a question for either of these two gentlemen to use that chat functionality and uh, toss in your, your questions that you might have. And in the meantime, while that's happening, uh, Charlie, do you want to give a closing kind of thought here? Yeah, I mean, I think... Um... I think what I'm most inspired by, by Weston, what you've written and what you've said is um, the wildly meaningful impact that you can have on a kid and thinking of technology's role in that, like you said, technology is, is great. Teachers are better. Um, any, any kid that was a troubled kid um, and you, and you know them, or maybe you were that kid, you know, um, my, my, one of my very best friends, he was that, problem kid like my son was a problem kid but even he was a very big problem kid and he said it was that one teacher it was that one teacher that believed in him invested in him and like a lot of people have that, that one teacher story um and i think what's so scary about technology 
is that technology can be a way to offload a kid onto something, right? Um, instead of a way to engage them and pull them in, right? And I think for me, boy, the challenge for our company, which lives sort of outside of the school district, is how in the world do we find a way to put two and two together, not use technology to break apart teacher-student relationships, but to build them? Um, I don't even know that we totally have the answers to those questions, and I think that's okay. Um, I think we just have to ask ourselves those questions. Um, that's my, that's, I think that's where we're at right now as an organization. That's awesome. There's Josh, a couple of uh, questions popping in in the chat. Do you see those, yeah. Weston? Yeah, do you mind? Oh. Uh, so Greg Bagby has uh, an awesome question. Hey, P.S. Greg, great to see you on here, buddy. Uh, I'll, I'll give Greg a plug here real quick. Uh, dude is a great follow on Twitter. Uh, go check out Greg, uh, Greg's uh, uh, Twitter handle. Uh, uh, he does not, he did not ask me to say that. Yeah, look at you, Greg. <laughs> well done, my man. Uh, so he asks a good question. Uh, he says flat out, uh, if a student is more captivated by the tool, uh, not the teacher, how would you leverage that to build a relationship? So such a great question, right? So uh, the example that comes to mind immediately for me is, is an example with my, own, with my own child, right? Like with my son. Uh, I will tell you this. Uh, my son loves Minecraft, loves it. Here's something you need to know about me. I do not give a flying crap about Minecraft. Like, <laughs> forgive me. Like, I don't, I, don't, I don't care about Minecraft at all. But you know what I really love? I really love my kid, right? And so, like, uh, there are times when we will have conversations about the build that he's working on in Minecraft. Why? Because I want to use the tool, the thing, as a conduit uh, to build a relationship and have a conversation about something he authentically cares about. And it's so funny. I, I, I have this conversation uh, all the time with teachers. Like, we got to find out what it is uh, that makes our kids tick. And for a lot of our kids, like, it's good to be technology. Like, that is very much a part of their world, something they're emotionally really invested in. And we can either push back on that and create cognitive dissonance and emotional dissonance between us and kids, or we can use that uh, to connect us to children. And so again, I don't care about Minecraft, but I love my kid. And so you know what, like, we're going to have some conversations about Minecraft. And I, I said this one time, and I had, a, uh, I had a teacher push back on me. And she said, she was like, well, it's not my job to like what kids like. I said, you're exactly right. But it is your job to know what kids like, mm -hmm. because that is the medium through which we create connectivity, right. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, uh, you know, Greg, to answer your question, like, that's, that's what it has to be for us. Like, we, we can push back on the notion that kids love technology and they invest too much time, energy, and effort into it, or we can recognize that's a very much a part of their reality and we can use it as a medium through which we connect. I love it. That's awesome. Did anybody else just get a pop-up for the exit survey? Um, Kate, did you just push that through for us all? I did. Yes, I did. Okay, I did. perfect. All right, good. We'll, we'll, we'll take the last few minutes that we have and complete this exit survey. I just want to remind it. I don't know if this was actually made public, but everyone who is in attendance today is going to get a Starbucks gift card and Kate is paying for it. So thanks for, <laughs> thanks. Thanks, yeah. Kate. Yeah. You're, thanks. you're so welcome, everybody. I'm happy to do it. So happy thanks, to Kate. have hey. everyone here. <laughs> thanks, Kate. Do I, do I get one too? I'm hoping I get one too. Absolutely. Of course you do. <laughs> Yeah, I, I technically registered for the webinar, so yeah. I'm hoping I get one as well. Um, Weston, give us some final thoughts, man. Yeah, final thoughts. Uh, I, I said it once at the, at the start of our time. I'll say it again. Uh, let's recognize the greatest gift that we can give a child right now. Uh, it's not more assessments. It's not more content. It's not more stuff. It is a relationship with an adult who believes with relentless tenacity in their ability to succeed. Uh, and we have to seek ways to use technology, use the, uh, use the amazing things that are at our disposal uh, to create points of connectivity between us and children, children and one another, and children in the content in meaningful ways. Uh, and we live in this beautiful Beautiful moment where that is uh, that is possible thanks to the technology that we have available to us um, and so uh, that's those are sort of uh, my parting thoughts and uh, let's let's make sure like guys the mission and vision of ed tech uh, was never uh, kids sitting in rows uh, on their devices um, disengaged from their teacher and from their peers uh, it was always that uh, technology was uh, supposed to be a greater conduit, conduit for connectivity. Um, and let's make sure that we, we have it rightfully ordered and how we think about instructional design and how we think about the role of technology in education. Uh, and I'll, uh, I'll continue to shout it from the rooftops. Uh, education is not broken. 
my friends. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. you'll hear this from people all the time uh, and I'll shout it from the rooftops. Education is not broken. Our schools are not broken. Our system is not broken. I mean, in the age of global pandemic, when it got as bad as we think it could have possibly gotten, like, look where people lined up. They lined up outside of our nation's schools for help uh, to make sure their kids were fed physically, mentally, and emotionally. And that has everything to do with the relationships that they've built with people in that, bu in that building and in that school and in that district. And so uh, please, if you have not done so, uh, thank a teacher today uh, for all of their hard work. It's the hardest time ever to be a teacher, school leader, district administrator. Um, and I'll tell you what, if you are a teacher, school leader, or district administrator, uh, make sure you got your eye on the prize and we're using this technology for the right stuff. Awesome. Where can we find your book other than in my hands? Yes, absolutely. Don't worry, Josh doesn't have the only copy. Uh, you can find those books uh, there. It's published by the International Center for Leadership and Education. You can find those books at leadered.com or if you, if you want to go to Amazon and have it tomorrow, you can go on amazon.com uh, and find it. Uh, again, the, two, uh, the books are Bold School and Breaking Bold. Bold School is very much about strategies and tools uh, in future-focused classrooms, and Breaking Bold is about cultivating relationships using those, uh, those tools and strategies in future-focused learning environments. Guys, thank you so much uh, for having me today. I'm so grateful. I could sit here and talk to you for another hour. I'm sure people want to get their coffees and, and get out of here. Uh, thanks to everyone. I see, your, I see your comments in the chat. It's been so great to be with you guys. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you all. All right. Thanks, Wes. Thanks, thank Thanks, everybody. Be well. Thanks, guys. Have a good one. Hey, Kate, are we done? Do we, do we need to do anything? No, we do not. We do okay. not. No, we're all done. So if. Yeah. Well, Weston, thank you very much for doing this. Hey, thank you guys. This was uh, I, no joke. Like I could sit here and chat you guys up for another yeah. hour. Yeah, <laughs> we could. We could. We're, you know, with, when you have the, sim, the same kind of intrinsic motivation, the same drive, it, we, I feel like we're a, we're a community. I yeah. have not met a, a teacher yet that I haven't like, man, I like you, you know, yeah. it's just, there's just something about it. But yeah, I had a blast. I can't wait to see the blogs. You know, I guess we'll follow up, but Kate's kind of running point on that, but you know, we'll use this as a springboard to get into some deeper discussion um, through the blogs. And we really appreciate your help. I go back with ICLE way back, way back to, I was a math teacher. So I, you know, I taught here in the school district that I live in. I taught algebra and geometry. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> when I was there, we were doing a lot of school improvement and got hooked up with ICLE. And um, so, yeah, you know, we have that, I, I use the rigor relevance framework even now, you know, in my, in my yeah. work with school improvement. So it's very much part of my identity. I feel like we've had a great connection.